one of the areas that is particularly relevant to trading that comes from positive psychology is the notion of identifying our strengths and fully immersing ourselves in our strength. So understanding what we're really good at, what, yep. what is meaningful to us, what, what we're skilled at, and using that to absorb ourselves in what we're doing, which makes us much more effective when we're in that zone, when we're um, in the state where we can have those peak experiences. Welcome to this week's episode of the Alpha Mind podcast. The first podcast dedicated to exploring the mindset and the psychological skills needed to succeed in financial markets. This podcast is co-hosted by myself, Stephen Goldstein, a former investment bank trader and recognized market dinosaur turned trader mindset coach, and Mark Randall, a former futures broker and fellow dinosaur with almost four decades of market experience behind him, now turned mindfulness guru. This week, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Brett Steenbarger, widely respected as the world's leading expert and authority on the psychological aspects of trading and investment performance. This is an excellent interview with many superb stories and profound insights, which will be a great addition and resource on your lifelong journey into trading. And please, if you enjoy this interview, could you rate it and leave some feedback? This helps get noticed on iTunes. So it would really help us if you can do that. And also feel free to share it with friends and colleagues. And now without further ado, on with the podcast. Thank you, Brett. It's a huge honor to have you. Thank you for having me. I don't know, maybe you could just tell the audience a little bit about you. I think they, that most of them will know you in some way or have heard of you. But, you know, perhaps you can, you can sort of just... Uh, Tell everyone who you are and what you do. Okay, I'm happy to. So uh, to go back a little bit in time, uh, I, I'm a psychologist by training. I did my uh, clinical psychology work at the University of Kansas, and it was there that I also started uh, trading on a regular basis. So trading was always a side interest for me, but my main interest was um, as a psychologist. And so uh, after I graduated, I ended up uh, working for a couple of years in the field and then joined the faculty at SUNY Upstate Medical University, a medical school in Syracuse, New York, where I ran a student counseling program for medical students and residents and health science students. And so uh, worked with them on the issues that they faced as young adults growing into the medical profession. I did that for about 15 years, in addition to teaching on the faculty and doing research and other good things. Um, okay. But it was very interesting working with a student population because uh, it was working with basically healthy people, bright people, ambitious people who were trying to make the most of their education, their performance, and balance the demands of life and uh, their work. So uh, all during that time, I followed financial markets and traded on the side, but my main work was as an academic psychologist. And then uh, I decided to join the two and write my first book in 2003. It was called The Psychology of Trading. And uh, it was at the urging of a mentor of mine who I value highly, Victor Niederhofer. And uh, the book, it turned out, became popular. And uh, a trading firm in Chicago discovered the book and made an offer for me to come on board full time and work with their traders. So I left the ivory tower, took a part time position at the medical school on the clinical faculty, which I kept to this day, and started working full time with traders. That was 2004. And since then, I've been working with traders in proprietary trading firms, at hedge funds, asset management firms, all different kinds of professional trading situations. But the, the real surprise of it all was that working with traders was not so different from working with the college students who I had worked with at Cornell University in Ithaca, and not so different from the medical students I had worked with in Syracuse. Uh, it's working with bright people who have a lot of demands on them and who are trying to balance their work and their life 
And so the techniques that worked for the students ended up being very relevant for the traders I worked with. And that's how I got my start. That's fascinating. So, you know, hearing your story there, I'm thinking you were the original Wendy from Billions. <laughs> well, that has been said, and yeah, <laughs> not quite so good looking, less dramatic. Uh, yeah, and in fact, the work I do with folks is very different from what's portrayed on television, but it is the same basic role, a psychologist who is helping portfolio managers and traders with their performance, um, sometimes by working with them on their trading and sometimes by working with them on their lives. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. Mark, Mark, you must have some questions after that. <laughs> oh, <clears throat> crumbs, I think, where, where do you start? I think, uh, I, I think the idea that uh, trading communities are very similar to student communities, that certainly resonates with me for many, many reasons. That power, that energy, that, uh, that curiosity that comes with it, you know, and the need to manage yes. so many things that are up in the air at any one time. Um, certainly from um, the work that I've done um, for over the years, yeah, I think you, you bring out a very good point there, Brett, in, in terms of the need to just keep that balance going too. It's not just about the job and kind of you get the balance right, it sort of powers what you do at the job. You get the balance wrong and it becomes a drain. You know, you're having to get tight to sort of stay relevant um in financial markets so yeah I can, I can a lot of that resonates with with what we see you know with with the alpha mind sort of messaging as we start to sort of interview and uh speak to more people across the space there is that mm -hmm. need just make sure you've got balance yes a and one similarity between uh, learning medicine and learning trading is that you are inundated with information there is more information that medical students are faced with than they can ever possibly fully process. And so somehow you have to pick out what is relevant from what is less relevant. And it's a similar cognitive challenge in trading. There is more information from various financial markets than you could ever possibly process yourself. And so the challenge is to pick out what's relevant, find the patterns, and keep your mind fresh so that you can pick out what's most relevant and not become overwhelmed. Yeah, and no, I think that, that that's absolutely uh, the case. There's, I guess it also starts off with having the mindset to actually have that open awareness to see a breadth of uh, information rather than, you know, you're aware that in, in a sort of a stress state where you're not managing yourself, you start to get spotlight vision where you, you, you get seeing something so very, very small and you're kind of ignoring the periphery. Uh, and the periphery is often where the opportunity lies and where the discoveries lie. Um, yes. I, much for the medical world as it is for the trading world, yeah? The, the, the discoveries are out there, but you can have the focus in the wrong place, and it can be too focal rather than too rather than broad enough, really, to get to see those, those edges. Yes, yes. And another similarity uh, in the, with the medical world is that at the same time that you are – managing yourself to learn optimally, you're also um, learning skills, managing that whole process. And so you're uh, processing information, but you're learning skills, you're learning how to do something. And, and so it's that combination of intensively learning skills and at the same time intensively maintaining an optimal mindset for the learning that makes the two somewhat similar. Yeah, there's, there's so many similarities, you know, as I'm thinking about it and as I'm hearing you, and, and I'm, I'm sure you must be familiar with the work of Atul Gawinde. Um Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, I, and I, I've read a lot of his stuff and I find that you know, in my own work, I mean, I'm, I'm not a psychologist. I, I don't have that background, but I find that I'm often reading so much about behavior from, from the medical profession because there's so much more documented and there's been so much more effort on, on, on trying to optimize how people are when they're in that profession because, well, it's life or death. You know, at the end of the day, yeah, so, sorry, you were saying? 
Yes, yes. So I, I think the work of Atul Gawande is, is uh, the checklist manifesto uh, is extremely relevant to trading. Uh, what Gawande found was that if we base our work, our clinical work, on objective evidence, on outcome research, in other words, if we are evidence-based, then we can create these checklists to make sure that we are following the right procedures that have the best outcomes. And of course, he uh, originally did that in a surgical setting. Yeah. Uh, but for traders, uh, it's the same thing. We can look at our outcomes and identify our own best practices, and we can turn those best practices into checklists that ground our decision making. So very similar evidence-based mindset in advanced medicine and in trading. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean the overlaps are so, that there are so many. It, there's, I mean, the checklist manifesto is about developing processes and every single really successful trader, I think I've ever talked about, talks about the importance of having a process and constantly trying to refine that process but making sure that you go back to it when you go yes. you know and when when you go off it yes now the one difference and this is something i wrote about in uh, my last book the trading psychology 2.0 you know in medicine the processes do change somewhat when new outcome research comes out and, and suddenly what we thought was a best practice is no longer a best practice. And so we have to you know, change uh, some of those items on the checklist as it were. Uh, but in markets, when we deal with financial markets, they can radically change from period to period. And yeah. so what worked in one period of time, let's say when we had a trending market with high volatility, can fail dramatically when we have low volatility in a rangy market. And yeah. so the idea of traders, quote unquote, following a process misses the adaptive aspect of always needing to change those processes to adapt to evolving market conditions. Yeah, and I, I guess that, that's one of the challenges of trading. You know, it's... I, I, it's, it's, if I could just jump in, it, yeah. it's one of the challenges of trading and it's one of the challenges of coaching because so many people who try to mentor or try to coach, they haven't really had exposure to financial markets. And so what can happen is that we can get in the wrong emotional state, so to speak, and that can interfere with good trading. But also markets can change on us and frustrate us and put us in the wrong mindset. Yeah. And many, many, many times when we see a trader in the wrong mindset, in the wrong emotional state, it's not because of a psychological problem. It's because something has changed in markets that they have not adapted to. And the answer is not simply to do some kind of psychological exercise. The answer is to figure out what is going on in the marketplace and how could I meaningfully adapt to that? Fascinating stuff. I think the the ability to have fluid intelligence in financial in financial markets is I think critical to uh, yep. wake up to the fact that there's been a change to realize the change and to have the ability in in real time to sort of reset and, and refocus and sort of refresh yourself in in whatever way that means and is relevant to you. I think that. Um, you know, and, and, and micro stuff, you know, not like nothing that's like long winded, but the ability to within a moment just to step back and to reconsider just what's just happened and to have yes. cognitive, I guess, clarity to absorb that sudden shift in the norm and to very, very quickly realign yourself to the uh, the opportunity, which may be a case. That's right. Like and not trading as well as walking towards and working out what to trade. That's as powerful as trading, that ability to step back and actually do nothing. Right, right. And to understand the situation, 
when I uh, wrote my book on uh, trader, um, enhancing trader performance, I tried to capture the learning process of how people develop expertise as traders. And one of the fields that I studied uh, in writing that book were uh, military special forces teams. Because in the special forces teams, they face very rapidly changing conditions. And they have to adapt to what the enemy is doing. And so they can practice certain maneuvers, but they also have to have that fluid, flexible thinking that you're talking about and be able to act in real time based on those quick assessments. And so uh, that struck me as a nice metaphor for what many traders in financial markets need to do. Uh, absolutely. In the way that uh, I've built up essentially my sort of corporate mindfulness program or mind fitness program is that it's um, – and I, I spent time with the, the Joeys who came over from, from the States for some workshops, and they built the um, the Pentagon mind fitness program for the special forces. And right. um, I was so pleased that my work was just so, so aligned to theirs. And it's a case of, you know, short, sharp – and, and discipline and awareness and using your environment to, to, to tune in um, was vital because, of course, we've all, we're all involved in some sort of theater of war. A market is a theater of war in, in, in a market right. um, with threats and opportunities and, and risks and, and all of those things. And you've got to be pretty, pretty agile to survive in that VUCA type of world uh, that is so ambiguous. Um, right, right. You can't do that with a stressed, closed mind. You yet, can't. That's it's right. Not work. That's right. And yet yes. there is one. There is one challenge there, which you know, I've 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 worked with a few traders who have served in the military, and, and in fact, one guy who was um, who served in Afghanistan, and he decided to become a trader, and he made quite a good fist of it, and then he got into problems because of his ego, and. Mm. You know, he, he said to me, I never faced this on the battlefield. He said, I'm sometimes more fearful than I was when I had physical bullets coming at me than I do with oh, the, market, the market bullets yeah. coming at me. And I, and I find myself paralyzed sometimes, unable to make a choice. And it, it, it's really bizarre. But he said, it's, you know, it, it, he said really, really strange. In the, in the battlefield, you're going to get hit or you're not. <laughs> Uh, and you're, right. trained for, you're trained for that, but you're not prepared for this mental battle that goes on in the markets. And, and I mean, I guess as a psychologist, you must see this all the time. Yes, yes. So an, an analogy would be the difference between being on uh, a, a normal expected battlefield versus uh, fighting an enemy who's utilizing tactics that you've never seen before. And that would be quite disorienting. And so um, could uh, could lead uh, someone to uh, have trouble making decisions and functioning on the battlefield. In markets, many times there will be changes in the ways that the markets are moving. Someone might have a portfolio, and the portfolio has been constructed with a certain set of correlations among the assets in mind because they want diversification, of course. And yep. those correlations will shift in real time. And the volatilities of the underlying instruments will shift in real time. And they won't be aware of those shifts in real time. And suddenly the portfolio is not acting the way it's supposed to be acting. And they find themselves frustrated, anxious. That interferes with decision making. Yeah, que questioning themselves. Yes, yes. But it's not a psychological problem. No, it's a problem of of not, of not understanding their book. They don't understand what's happening, you know, the changes that are going on, and that triggers a psychological response. Yeah, but that's the tricky part. Is sometimes the trading creates the emotional upheaval, and sometimes the emotional upheaval hurts the trading. Bit of chicken and egg, and so as a coach, you have to figure out. Is this a problem that someone is having with their market, or is this a personal problem that they are bringing to the market? Those are very different things, and yet both occur and both are really important. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and, and like you say, you lose yourself when it's the market because you start to question yourself. And, and that's yes. when you can Yeah, make... so you become disoriented. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I was, I got, I'd love to carry on this conversation, but I'm, I'm aware of the time and we want to get as much of you as possible out there sure. at the moment. Um, I, I wanted to move on to your this project you're working on. Before I do, I want to check in with Mark whether you've got any questions, Mark. Well, I, I, th I think, you know, it's super relevant. I, I think, you know, learning is so significant and learning at speed in markets. Sometimes you have to you have to learn something pretty rapidly to understand implications, PAM portfolio or um, or broader, you know, PAM business. So, so that <clears throat> that sort of managing yourself so that you can always do that as fast as possible is something that, that I sort of pick up from what Brett said, and I totally agree. I've having been in markets, you know, if you've not got that ability to sort of shake yourself up and, and, and see clearly what's just happened and what the implications are, then it starts to, uh, then it can for many and, and many that perhaps have not spent time learning. Perhaps, uh, yeah, there's, I, and, you know, I know that in the markets that there are some people that are very experienced traders from having been behind a desk for many years, but you know, they, they, they may not totally know their products as well as they should. And so when shocks appear, you know, it, it hits them harder because they just not got that depth of knowledge. And so certainly for any new traders that are listening to this podcast, the idea of just keep learning and, and know your product, really get to know your product. Because when a shock happens, if you don't know what's going on, they haven't got that foundation of understanding, then you're not going to be very optimal in terms of your reaction to that. But yeah, I think I, I think Brett, perhaps that's a good moment for uh, us to hear more about this new project uh, of yours. In uh, uh, I think we're very very interested to hear about that. Yes, yes. Well, it's a uh, book that I'm writing. I've I've written four books in the area of uh, trading psychology, and so this is the fifth. But this is different than the others. Uh, the title of the book is Radical Renewal, and uh, it is about trading and spirituality. So it's a little bit different from the psychology of trading. It's really about the spirituality behind trading. And uh, one of the unique aspects of the book is that I'm writing it on a blog platform which means that uh, there will be embedded links, there will be embedded graphics, readers will be able to comment, and I'll be able to comment on their comments, so the book will be interactive. And best of all, on a blog platform, the book will be free of charge to uh, anyone who uh, has an online connection anywhere in the world. So uh, it's, it's a unique project in that respect. But the uh, the key idea behind the book is that a great number of trading problems do not stem from psychological problems. It's not that people have diagnosable emotional disorders that carry over into their decision making in financial markets. Rather, many, many, many problems in trading occur when our egos intrude on our decision-making processes. Yeah. So yeah. We, yeah, we become ego-involved in profit, profits and losses. Yeah. We become ego-involved in making market calls and being right in predicting the market. We get ego-involved when we worry about missing opportunity, when we over-trade. All of those are ways in which we become too attached. And, and, and there's a good term from Eastern philosophy. We become too attached to the outcomes of, of trading. And, yeah. and so we have this interesting dilemma where here it is, you know, we're, as traders, we are involved in the most materialistic of pursuits. I mean, it's all about making money, right? Right, yeah. And yet, if we become too attached to profits and losses and making money 
we suddenly find our decision making distorted and we are unable to objectively respond to evolving market conditions. How do we move beyond the ego to be able to tap into the soul? We able to get past those distorting influences. And it turns out there are many spiritual traditions around the world and have been there for centuries and beyond that contain tools for us to overcome ego. And we see it in various religions. We see it in various philosophical and spiritual teachings. And we can harness those tools, become more effective in this materialistic pursuit of trading. It's yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, I, I, I go back to an individual when I'm hearing you talk about this. There's an individual that makes it into so many of my coaching sessions and he's made it into a few of these podcasts already, but he doesn't know yeah. that. He doesn't know that. Hmm. He, he, he's a trader I coached. I was working on a, a project, at a U.S. investment bank in Hong Kong about eight years ago. And mm -hmm. they, they, they'd asked me to come and they put this program out. Um, I said, Steve, could you come and coach our traders in Hong Kong? We've got, yeah, we've got several hundred. And I think I, I explained this story earlier in another podcast where I'm, I was thinking, wow, that's a great pay, payday. <laughs> there must be hundreds of them to be coached. And, mm -hmm. and eight, eight people came back, eight people volunteered for it. So I was, <laughs> eight traders volunteered. So I was a little bit disappointed out of this yeah. I think they said five or six hundred. And, mm -hmm. and, and anyway, I, I, I got the background on the on the, you know, the individuals who had put their hand up and the manager of one of them said to me, you know, this guy is the best trader in the entire firm. And I, went, I said, well, mm -hmm. here in Hong Kong, he went, no, worldwide. And this was a very big wow. investment bank. I won't mention yeah, that. Yeah. So I, I said, I'm curious as to, you know, what's his angle on? you know, on the coaching, what's he looking for from it? And he said, he just wants to get better. A any, anyway, mm -hmm. I met this guy and he came into the meeting room for the first coaching session. A and it, it was hard to describe. It was almost like someone walked in a room with virtually no ego. <laughs> mm. He was egoless, but he did have an ego because he had the drive and he had the passion and he had the intensity sure sure but he, he, he was also he, he you know he was from an, he was from an eastern culture as well but mm. he, he you know he, when he started talking about his trading and the way he managed risk and the way he looked at risk the way he held risk the way he exited risk it, it was almost like he was talking about someone else and, and it it turned out right. not, not surprisingly that he was also a very successful poker player what's being a market maker in a bank he was also in the world mm -hmm. top 200 poker players. So he often described his process with, with poker, which was so similar. And, um, you know, I, I remember sort of almost being a little bit in awe as I was coaching him because, you know, it was so rare to come across someone like this. And I have come right. across a few really successful individuals, traders. Um, Adam Nash, who was on our last podcast, um, he, he's a private trader. And when I coached mm -hmm. him about seven, eight years ago, I described him as being so comfortable in his own skin. Right. Uh, you know, he didn't care what anyone else thought about him. You know, it was all about doing the right things that lead to the right outcomes, like you just described it about two minutes ago. He made a lot of money because he did the right things, not because he had this focus on making a lot of money right you know so it was you know it it, it 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 was it was a similar thing he was comfortable in his own skin this guy at the bank in hong kong was comfortable in his own skin and it was like their ego it was almost like they left their ego at home every single day right right and uh, you know i can relate to that state of mind as a psychologist you know, that when I meet with a client, if I'm trying to help someone make improvements in their lives, let's say it's a student in student counseling, my first job is to sit with them and listen, to understand what they're going through, 
and I'm going to ask questions and ask questions and ask questions. I'm going to process that information, process that information, and at some point, the patterns in their life are going to become clear to me. And I'll have a sense for how they might be able to change those patterns. But the first step is to empty my mind and to listen, 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 absorb, 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 and let that pattern come to me. And that's a very similar mind state that successful traders have. Yeah. Where they're not going in with the ego. They're not going in predicting the market and, and saying what the market's going to do. They are watching, 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 watching. They're processing information, processing information, processing information. It may be fundamental information. It may be technical information. It, it may be quantitative information. They're processing, processing, and eventually it comes together. They realize what's happening, how the market's moving, and they can make decisions on that basis. Um, and that's uh, very different from nice. operating from the ego. We will return to the podcast shortly, but first some insight into Alpha Mind. Alpha Mind is a collaboration between two market veterans, Stephen Goldstein and Mark Randall. Stephen is a former professional trader who now works as a coach to people and businesses in financial markets. His business, Alpha R Cubed, provides mindset coaching to traders and investment professionals at all levels and executive and team coaching to financial market businesses. Stephen sees trading as a dual challenge. That is the tangible challenge against the markets and the mindset challenge that people have to overcome themselves. The two of these are closely connected. However, it is the intangible aspects of trading where he specializes as a coach. You can check out his and Alpha R Cubed's work at alphaRcubed.com. That is the letter R or email info at Alpha R Cubed if you'd like to know more about their work. Mark Randall has over 30 years working as a professional broker in the industry. Mark used mindfulness techniques to enable him to optimize his performance to be at his best for his clients. Later in his career, he started giving talks, seminars and workshops to corporate leaders and investment businesses about how to apply and use mindfulness to work more effectively and productively. His form of mindfulness is based on the same techniques and processes used by the US military special forces. Mark has developed his practice into what he calls mind fitness, a form of military grade mindfulness. If you are interested to know more about Mark and how he can help you and your business, he can be contacted at ceo at markrandallconsultancy.com. Now back to the podcast. You know, I just want to bring up, you know, cause, because of course performance in sport links so closely to performance in, in training. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Roger Federer, there's no ego, just... just Showing up to do his best, as, as it yes. were, um, without sort of predicting, when having total respect for the people that you know support him, for those that that he faces, doesn't say a bad word. But and and that there's something to be said about that, right? That that there's an attitude yeah. that comes with that with that success. So you can yes, it. yes, and then whoever in wherever performance and success is. You could sort of see the same thing, but in a you know, in, in a slightly different right. clothing range. You know? <laughs> so, yeah. And if you, and if you look in the teachings of various world religions, it could be Buddhism, Hinduism, Christianity, Judaism, Islam. You find models for how you're to think in times of uh, stress and yeah. uncertainty. Yeah, how how do you process the world? What do you think about and how do you get past that ego? And uh, it's, it's, you know, the way I describe it in my book is that each of the religions and each of the great traditions, like one great crowdsourcing experiment, <laughs> centuries and centuries and generations after generations, all these techniques, all these approaches have been developed for people to be able to move forward in their lives in a spiritual sense. Yeah. And so we can examine these and not get caught up in which is the the true religion, you know, which one has uh, is right and which one is wrong, but rather look at all of them in the sense of crowdsourcing and say, what is it that people do in these traditions 
that helps them lead fulfilling lives, effective lives. And it's amazing uh, how relevant those lessons are. For and there's some commonality there, and so, certainly I think uh, with, with work that I've done, this, this concept of accessing our sort of very, very old ways of I guess you could almost call it sort of privileging as the, the pagan man of 10,000 years ago um, would have been so tuned into his senses, so aware of his environment, so aware of just observing things and yes. manage, managing himself in a probably a very natural way, a way that probably came sort of a second sense, as it were, and without making right. the effort to do it. But he was tuned into it because that's kind of how it was. There wasn't a distraction of that we've got so many distractions now. So I think, you know, if you look right. at the stuff that's come out of the East, and it's also about trying to access a behavior set and a mindset that we sort of lost, right? We sort of lost in the way that the Western world has evolved or the world in general is evolved. And it's trying to reaccess that because when we reaccess that, actually we, we tend to be more well, <laughs> we tend to perform better, and we tend to be better at sort of speaking and uh, respecting each other if because that's right. sort of common amnesty across all of those uh, um, devices yes. as it were that you talk about those really and if i could just jump if i yeah. could just jump in with one observation along that line there's just a ton of research as, as both of you know in uh, what's called positive psychology about spirituality and its effects on our emotional well-being, its effects on our physical health. And it turns out that many of the things we associate with a spiritual life have profound impacts on our mental health and physical health. One of the areas that is particularly relevant to trading that comes from positive psychology is the notion of identifying our strengths and fully immersing ourselves in our strengths. So understanding what we're really good at, what, yeah. what is meaningful to us, what, what we're skilled at, and using that to absorb ourselves in what we're doing, which makes us much more effective when we're in that zone, when we're... Um, in the state where we can have those peak experiences. Yeah, I describe so that as very, leveraging. very relevant to trading. I, Brett, I describe yeah. that as levering, as getting people to leveraging their strengths. So yes. often, often people come to me and they say, you know, Steve, I'm, I'm weak at this, I'm bad at this, I'm bad at this, I'm bad at this. And I say, okay, so what are you good at? <laughs> right. And, and they go, well, that's what I, I don't care what you're bad at, I want to know what you're good at. I want to know what makes right. you special. I want to know what gives you an edge. I want to know when you've succeeded, what was it you did yes. right? Because because in that is the source of what's going to make you successful. You're not going to be yes. successful by by getting rid of the bad stuff. It's the stuff that you're good at that you leverage. That's where you're successful. That's right. That's right. And And many times for developing traders particularly, they don't have insight into what they are good at. And so uh, collecting information about their trading at, uh, with the traders I work with in New York City at SMB, the, uh, the prop traders, oh, we nice. use a platform called TraderView, and it collects data on every trade that someone places, and it puts those trades into various categories, what was traded, the size that was traded, the time of day that it was traded, the strategy that was used. All these different tags go into the uh, each trade, and then you can sort and see which trades were effective and which trades were not. And it's a wonderful tool for self-discovery to really learn what your strengths are. Because then, if you know your strengths, you can do more and more of what works and eliminate much of the other. That's in it's interesting for me in two ways there, because First of all, just to let you know, I had breakfast with Mike Bellafiore and, oh, and, and, and Merritt Black just just today. Oh, uh, oh no, no, yeah, no, sure, not today. Sure. No, the, the previous week they were in London, and um, awesome. I was talking across Twitter earlier on with Merritt, asking me if he'd like to be a future guest. 
<laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. They're both wonderful, and uh, I'm yeah. glad you're in touch with them. Yeah, yeah, so so that's great. But the um, the, the the other point that you were making there, because I I asked traders to keep a I used to keep a trader journal when I was a trader, yeah, and it was one of the most powerful tools I ever kept, in helping me, mm -hmm. generate um you know sort of identify my patterns. I started to find my own patterns by keeping a journal, and what I did at the end of every month, is I asked myself the same set of questions. But it always started at, what did I do well this month? What three things did I yes. do well this month? So it was never the yes. negative, it was always the positive and accentuating yes. that. And then I asked, what three things could I have done better? So it wasn't what yes. did I do badly, but what could I have improved upon? And then I would do, what yes. one thing do I need to work on this month? And eventually, that one thing, after several months, would make it into the list of things I did well. So it was... right. It's it's that constant pro and I, and I try and get people to keep a trading journal. Yes, yes, a very very good point. And what you're really saying is that yes, as traders we have to be sensitive to and understand market patterns, but we have to be equally sensitive to and understand our own patterns. And we have patterns of success and failure, and we can learn from those, and we can become better and better at doing what we do well. Yeah, and, and I mean, one, one of the things is that we don't see them ourselves. You know, we're, we're always looking outward, we're not looking inward. And, and it's, I asked a great question of Mark a couple of weeks ago, because Mark was a broker for 30 years. And yeah. I'm, I'm always curious whether as a broker, could you identify the guys that you were speaking to, the, 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 lady, well, the, the women as well, so I, the, the guys yeah. and women that you were talking to, that were more likely to succeed than they weren't. And Mark, you what was you, you told me? Well, the answer was yes. <laughs> so, yeah, but how, how, tell, 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 tell me how you described it. Well, it was um, there was a, there was a calmness and the confidence and the positive nature about the people that, like, you know, the, the ego was being managed. Uh, they were the people that were, you know, doing the learning. But you could tell through yeah. conversation that they, that they had a depth of understanding, that they had a that they were self-managing themselves. Um, yes. In in whatever yes. program they were they were using, they were also um, they also went when you talked to them a bit more. They were very respectful about the support of their families, uh, which was which I found mm -hmm. very very interesting. So in terms of the positivity side, they'd always talk about what the kids were doing, you know, the stuff that the the wife was getting involved in a very, very positive sense. So whatever they were talking about nice. had a positive edge. And I think that goes back to balance to some extent, but you could uh, you could certainly sense that. It became apparent very, very quickly um, just from their presence, as it were, uh, from the way that they connected with space around them, you know? Right, right. Well, that, that's getting into a whole other area that I've been involved in when uh, a hedge fund brought me into Connecticut full time. Uh, after I was working in Chicago, I became part of a four person committee that was coordinating global recruitment of portfolio managers. And so I learned to evaluate what goes into success. And, and we did research on it and yeah, ended up uh, being uh, pretty successful in identifying talent. And one of the factors that you are pointing to was was apparent that people who had many positive things going on in their lives were much more likely to be resilient during periods of time when trading wasn't working out. And, and so I describe that as having a diversified life portfolio. They had many different activities and many different things in their lives that gave them happiness and fulfillment. And so when trading didn't work out, they had stores of energy from other parts of their lives. That became important to longevity. Uh, a second thing that ended up being very important to success was what we might call self-awareness. The people who were the most successful traders could describe in exquisite detail their edge in financial markets and what they did that made them successful. They were very detailed and they had detailed processes, as you pointed out earlier, for various 
parts of their trading. They had processes for generating ideas, processes for managing risk, processes for balancing a portfolio, and would go into real detail about all of these. So they not only had an edge, so to speak, in markets, but they were very aware of that edge, which helped them stay true to what they did best. They had multiple, they had multiple edges working for them. They had personal edges, they had process edges, but they had, um, like yep. you said, you know, they, they had this almost a spiritual edge is, is where we're getting back to this, this book now. You know, something about the way they carried themselves. Yes, yeah. yes. And, and the spiritual edge uh, shows up in uh, really interesting ways. So, for instance, how people respond to loss. You know, everyone has losing trades. Uh, so how do people respond to loss? There's a um, story in the uh, Jewish tradition of a rabbi, and his name was Rabbi Nahum, N-A-C-H-U-M, and, and uh, he had a very difficult life of poverty and illness, and something would happen, would, uh, uh, he, it would befall him, and he would respond uh, in Hebrew, gamzu latoiva, which means this too is for the good, because he saw every challenge as something that could make him better. Every challenge was something he could learn from. And so even though he was poor, even though he was sick, he could be grateful to the things that befell him, even when they were not good things. He had a, he had a... <laughs> and so that's what we see with traders. They can lose yeah. and they can have setbacks and they can step back and learn from those. It's almost as if they're saying, come to Latoiva, they're saying this too is for the good. We can learn from this, we can become better. And they embrace their fallibility, they embrace their mistakes, and they use those as motivation to get better and better and better. They're not threatened by them, they don't get frustrated by them. They really embrace the learning and development, even when they're experienced folks. And that, now, that gets into uh, the spiritual perspectives. Now, now what, what I hear you describing at this point now is Carol Dweck's growth mindset. Right, right. It, it sounds very similar. I mean, are, are you familiar with her work? Oh, yes, 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 yes. She's done wonderful work. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I've read her book a few times now, and uh, it, it just... You know, I see so much of that in traders. When we talk about, you know, these people who, you know, a fixed mindset is really about having an ego or allowing, it's allowing your ego to get the better of you. I think part of what Carol says is that we we yeah. often move between the two. Um, but I, I know I, I know from my own trading years that when I got into trouble, it was because that 10 ton elephant, the ego came charging in on the blind side, you didn't yes. see it coming. And, and then yes. I, be, I, I became a fixed mindset person. And it was all about right. me, and, me and trying to make myself look better. And yet, when I was in a growth mindset, I could take these losses, painful as they were, in my stride and restart again the next day fresh. That's right, that's right. That's a really good example. One of the things we found out at one of the hedge funds where I worked when we did internal research, was that uh, we, we did a, a psychological assessment of the portfolio managers and we looked at the most successful portfolio managers versus the others. And of course I was expecting in the vein of positive psychology that the most successful portfolio managers would show the most positive emotion, um, emotions over time. And in fact, they did not. In fact, the, po the successful portfolio managers were more likely to express negative emotion than positive emotion. And okay. that was completely unexpected. I did not anticipate that whatsoever. So I went back to the portfolio managers and I asked, you know, what, what's going on here? And what it turned out to be is something I've written about recently in, in my uh, latest Forbes article about forgiveness and repentance is that these portfolio managers had very high expectations of themselves. They were very successful. 
and they were very aware of their potential and what they could do. And when they fell short of their potential, they felt terrible. It wasn't just that they were beating up on themselves. It was that they acutely felt that they were letting themselves down and letting investors down, the investors whose capital they're managing. And out of that, they, they felt real remorse. And what it reminded me of was uh, folks I worked with when I was in community mental health um, who were alcoholics and went to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous. And at some point, they would drink and they would drink too much and they would lose their jobs, they'd lose their marriages, they'd lose their friendships, they'd lose their money. And at some point, they would quote unquote hit bottom. At some point, they would recognize that they had made a mess of things and they would feel such remorse that they, and, and such a need for repentance and forgiveness that they would reach out uh, to an AA community and they would reach out to a higher power, as they say, and seek new direction. And that's what was happening on a, a somewhat less dramatic scale with the portfolio managers. They were so aware of what they could do and how they fell short of it that they used that shortcoming as a motivation. It was, it was, they felt badly, and yet that bad feeling inspired them to do more, to, make, to repent, to do better next time. Uh, it was a very interesting psychological dynamic and uh, just as much part of their growth mindset as the positive emotions. Wow. Wow. That's, I mean, you might, Mark, can I bring you in there? Because, you know, I've got so many, <laughs> I've got so many questions going through my head here that I can't actually work one out at this point. Maybe, Mark, I'm going to, I'm going to put the, the burden on you. <laughs> Thank you. But it kind of sounds like real life, right? <laughs> it's, I mean, life is full of lumps and bumps. And, yes, um, absolutely. You know, we're learning that we have to take the burden of some of those bumps every now and then, but we learn and we move on and we reassess because we know that there's going to be a, a spike, a positive spike. So it goes back to balance. Yeah, none right. of us are perfect. So preparing for, you know, trauma uh, and, and things that go wrong is kind of like a natural state. And it filters through the trading as well. And I think it's, uh, as you were saying, Brett, the way that these people, you know, were sort of, uh, you know, taking it to heart, as it were. But yet they came back the next day and performed, right? It was quite, it was something that they were managing. They were admitting to, but they were coming back and they were still performing in the longer term. Right, right. You know, there's, there's something here about trauma, which I want to bring in. I know you've you've written about trauma. Um, yes. I, I, my, my mentor, um, an outstanding coach who, who actually coached me when I was a trader back in the year 2000, his name is Peter Burdett. And he, he said to me a few years ago that he's noticed, and it, this isn't any research, it's anecdotal, but he, he feels that he's noticed a pattern of a lot of almost outnum you know outnumbered sort of as, as the number of people who have had early life traumas who are very successful at trading. Hmm. Okay. I I I said well I, I don't know I mean I've seen a few of these myself but I can't say that I've noticed a pattern but I, I'm actually I I am actually seeing a client tomorrow who suffered an, you know a, a loss of a sibling at a very early age in life. Um. And the only thing I can think is that these people learn, you know, very early in their life that the world doesn't bend to their will. I, I, right. I, I'm just playing with guesses on that. Right, right. And they cultivate that resilience to be yeah. able to handle setbacks. Yeah. Uh, because uh, if you've been through something traumatic, uh, a, a, a normal loss in a financial market will seem trivial by comparison. Um, it's interesting also in Jack Schwager's Market Wizards interviews, a number of the folks, uh, successful manager, money managers that he interviewed had early career setbacks. 
Yes. And well, they might not have been traumas in the PTSD sense, but certainly had a traumatic impact on them as developing professionals. And out of those experiences, they developed a philosophy of trading and an approach that became theirs and that cemented their learning. Uh, and so the trauma ended up being ultimately a stage of growth for them. Yeah, yeah. that was the first thing I, no I noticed when I read Market Wizards the first time. I, I yes. noticed how often that happened. And, and you know, to them, they, these were devastating losses. They would normally have you know, a good start, three to six months of success, and then get wiped out completely. And they would talk yes. about how, you know, they couldn't face another human being, those sort of feelings. That, that's right. That's right. Linda Rashke has talked about it. Paul Tudor Jones has yeah. talked about it. Uh, some great, great traders uh, started out with that kind of early career setback and use that as learning and as inspiration to do things differently and do things better going forward. Ray Dalio is another one. He had his, uh, you know, he had an early setback that almost wiped his firm out before it before it even got off the ground. Um, wow. and mm -hmm. he, he talks about that a lot as well. Right, right. So, so it, it's, there, there is something there. And I, you know, I, I, when I read Market Wizards, I used to think, oh dear, I haven't had a big market setback yet. <laughs> I, <laughs> I need one. But it, it was, it, it's interesting because I think what that teaches you is that the world won't bend to your wheel. But it teaches you a much deeper level. It's not just something that you're sitting with consciously in your head. Because I think I think you always have to understand this at a much deeper subconscious level for it to really impact you. Yes. Yeah, yes. if I can get... and sorry, I beg your pardon. After you, Brett. Well, I was just going to say that many times those lessons are about risk management and uh, learning that, uh, learning humility, learning to be humble, <laughs> that uh, any bet can go wrong, and making sure that you can survive bets going wrong. Yeah, and I think it isn't it also that to not get so sucked into a positive event as well. So you know you've got this, That's these, right. these curves of lumps and bumps through life. If you can kind of smooth them out slightly you're kind of going to manage yourself a lot, lot better. So obviously you start to manage the negative stuff so it doesn't take control and you learn by it, you move on. But also on the, on the flip side is that you don't want to get carried away when you're in a hyper positive state because actually that won't do you any good either. No, and, and there's been a lot written, of course, about overconfidence bias and how that can affect our decision making in financial markets. And so um, it, it, it's sort of uh, opposite sides of the same coin that we learn resilience and handling setbacks and learn from those, but also we don't become ego involved when we have one winning trade after another, which could lead us to uh, think that somehow now we're smarter than the market. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's so true. Listen, I'm conscious of the time, Brett, and um, yes, I I I, I want to just ask you. So, where are you going with this project? Because this sounds almost like a project. I mean, what inspired you to do this? That's the first thing. And where are you going with it? Well, um, you know, my hope is that it leads to new conversations with traders and will be a resource for traders. Uh, not a lot has been written on this topic. And um, so it's a way for me to be able to give back to the trading world and interact directly with traders uh, literally around the world. So, um, you know, that's, uh, that's exciting uh, for me in that regard. Um, and I do tell the story in the book about uh, my own spiritual renewal and how that took place. And for many, many years, um, <laughs> I was probably the least spiritual individual you could, you could meet uh, and had very little interest in spirituality and um, had uh, something a couple of years ago 
uh, that happened that really turned my life around. And so that's been the inspiration uh, for my own personal development, but also for this book. Wow, that's terrific. Uh, um, perhaps, yeah. uh, Brad, can you just remind the audience just where they can find this book? Uh, and the name? Well, uh, it will, I will be, uh, it, it's, it's on a blog platform. It's going to be as a, uh, like a blog. And I will be releasing it by announcing it uh, on my current blog, which is Trader Feed, T R A D E R F E E D, traderfeed.blogspot.com. And I also have a Twitter account at Enbab, S T E E N B A B, and I'll be announcing the release of the book in August uh, through the blog and uh, through social media and, and particularly Twitter. That, that's great timing because we'll probably be, we'll probably be publishing this about then, about mid-August. We'll probably be releasing oh, great. This, this podcast. I, I will check it and great. I'll edit it and then I'll send it to you to listen to. But it, it's, it's, one, one thing before we sort of finish is it, it's really interesting because, you know, myself and Mark, you know, we, we came together with Alpha Mind earlier on this year. Yes. And I think there's a lot of the a lot of similar motives there. I think you'll right. agree with that, won't you, Mark? I know you will. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I think it's pretty clear from the conversation, Brett, that we've got these two different angles that are fusing together that that I guess are kind of I guess missing in the market in terms of advisory. Um and I think that's what you're tapping into as well the fact that this side is not often covered and yet if we touch right. on the softer side of managing yourself you know this huge power comes from it and with that comes opportunity in everything you do everything you touch yes yes um yeah i and i think uh, increasingly uh, traders and portfolio managers are open to this broader look at themselves and their performance yeah, I think I think you're a little bit more open on that side of the pond than we are on this side. Oh, okay. So I, okay. I found I found that over the uh, last few years. But the younger the younger generation, I think there's a slight change of mindset going on. Mm-hmm. So right. I, right. You know, I, I think I think there is a move that way. I think there's a lot more curiosity about you know Eastern spiritualism, and. Yes. Uh, I think that's kind of bringing some renewal into this area. You know, in in, in the philosophy I follow, which I, I explained on the uh, on on our email contacts, Gestalt Psychology. Yes. You know, the, the the group that I work with, they call it the relational turn. Have you heard of that from? Mm -hmm. uh, and yep. it's a movement that's happening in lots of different areas, and it, it's almost I. I it's quite hard to describe, but I think it's leaving behind a little bit that 20th century individual, you know, 20th century individual. It's one of the words I can only say after I've had a lot to drink. Individualism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I let it that in, individualism. So it's leaving behind that 20th century sort of focus on the self and realizing you're part of something much bigger. You know, you're part of lots of different systems, lots of different relationships. And, and you have to pay attention to those, and you have to, yes. you know, you have to start accepting your place in them, and then it becomes much easier for you to accept who you are, and become much more comfortable with you who you are, and and I think that that's move, right. That move is starting to happen, and it'd be great to see. I it agree. Come. I agree with you, and and one of the things I talk about in the book uh, is the emergence of online trading communities. And, tra and, yeah. com and trading communities within trading firms. And that community focus provides an expanded sense of self, provides uh, a, an array of resources for learning and inspiration. And yes, I find that younger developing traders are very open that kind of community focus and uh, mutual learning and teaching. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. And 
And any final thoughts, Mark, before we sort of sign off? Hello, Mark. Sorry, I'm on mute. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> Well, I, was just, uh, I, I, thought, I thought you'd headed down the pub already. I don't do things like that. <laughs> um, oh, I think yeah, the world is changing. The world is kind of waking up to being awake um, because it kind of often is walking around in a bit of a blur. And people are realizing that there's this sort of deeper sense of just being here um, and whatever tools they want to use to achieve that. But there are these methods that are starting to come to the surface that the young are buying into, and if, if this is where they find their edge, then I think we're going to see a lot more of them come to, you know, to, to understand what's going on. I guess part of the reason why these podcasts are there, Steve, is we're starting to share some of this stuff in the professional trading environment. And for, for right. people that are novices, then, you know, if you want to build up an edge that could turn into you being more successful, then pay attention to this side of yourself. Um, because if you neglect it, then you're going to be non-optimal. So I think there is a change. And like in the UK, we've got the Mindfulness Initiative, which is a, a governmental level, just managing the fact that UK PLC needs to be more optimal and needs to kind of wake up to a more curious, more uh, attentive, more self-aware sort of state of being. But I think there is this global movement of, of awakening, if that's the right word, uh, and we're all part of that. So all these podcasts, um, this podcast today is part of that to share these stories and make people aware that, you know, that this stuff exists, you know, learn, learn up and read more about it because it will definitely impact the way you behave in a very positive way. Yeah, no, that was great. That agreed, was great. agreed. Very nicely said. So, yeah, so Brett, that's been absolutely fantastic. I could have spoke to you and I'm sure Mark could have for hours, but we have to sort of bring this podcast to an end now. And I know you've got work to do as well. Uh, the audience, I'm sure, will get so much out of this and we'll have lots of questions and further questions. And I'm sure they'll be checking out your resources online. Thank you so much for speaking to us today. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure for me as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you to Dr. Brett Steenbarger. I'm sure you'll agree that was a fantastic interview and conversation. If you enjoyed this, please go and rate the podcast on iTunes. This helps us get greater attention and a wider audience. And if you can leave a review, that would help us too. We also have some great future podcasts lined up. So if you can, subscribe to the Alpha Mind podcast. And also feel free to check out some of our earlier podcasts, which have been some great interviews with leading individuals from the world of trading and investment. You can also check out our work on social media, where we produce articles and share insights on the mindset challenge of trading. Our homepage is alpha-mind.net. Our blog has a growing compendium of articles, book lists, and lists of other podcasts. You can find our blog at alphamindblog.blogspot.com. We are also active on Twitter at alphamind101 and at the Mind Guys. We also have a LinkedIn group with over 15,000 members. The group is called Alpha Mind, and we would be delighted if you connected with us on LinkedIn. We are also planning to start a newsletter soon, which you can sign up for on our blog page, alphamindblog.blogspot.com. Com. It has been a pleasure once again. A huge thank you again to Dr. Brett Steenbarger for sharing his perspectives on the mindset of trading and the spiritual aspects. Dr. Steenbarger's website is Trader Feed and you can find that at traderfeed.blogspot.com. That just leaves me to bid you farewell on behalf of myself and Mark Randall and good luck this week in whatever you're doing. Thank you. <laughs>